Don't sit on my mask. Number one five zero. One hundred and fifty. Does anybody need a book? We're gonna do three of them. One, two, and four. One, two, and four. Now this thing's tricky because you gotta go back and forth. You gotta do it. If I miss it, I'll just come on and sit here so we can see. Right. Let's stand as we say. So we can breathe better. Oh, that be day.
sister-in-law from Michigan, and we hopped down I-10, stopping two or three times to visit relatives and ending up in New Orleans. But it's nice to be home. There's nothing like home. Did you go to Bourbon Street? Yep, we stayed on Bourbon Street. <laughs> and I was amazed at the number of people that were there. Um, anyway, it's almost April. And our teachers for April, Bob will do our first Saturday, Elaine will do our second, Susan will do the 17th, and Susan is also going to do the fourth, but we'll do it on the third Saturday, because, because we are gonna have a covered dish at Susan Cato's house, um, just before a mixed bouquet, and I will send out the information. I didn't want to do it too early. We might forget. I don't want to do it too late. So anyway, it will go out probably sometime next week. Um, I understand that Janice wanted to thank us for our constant prayers uh, for her family and that she has regained some of the hearing, 50% of her hearing in one ear. She can talk to you now without her hearing aids. Wow. So, yay. And I understand that they are getting ready to return to Sunday school soon. Um, are there any announcements? We have a few things coming up, I think, this next week. Uh, Tuesday, Pat is having a meeting for the Mixed Bouquet uh, here at the church at the Family Life Center at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. Um, is it 10.30? 10.30. I'm glad you corrected me. I'd be here a half hour early. Oh my goodness. Anyway, and um, they are providing a $5 bag lunch. Uh, so if you can make Tuesday, that would be great. And then I think Leslie has a meeting coming up on, is it the 29th? Yes. Uh, uh, the yeah. 29th. Yeah, that might be the one at 10, but I'm not yeah. sure at yeah. that time. Um, to talk about um, our former UNW that is now SWIM and um, <laughs> she's looking for some volunteers for activities during the year. Um, are there any other announcements? Okay, Bill. Oh, Andy. What, what do you think about at some point going back to Sunday morning for our I think Sunday morning would be a wonderful idea. Yeah. I'm waiting for Pastor Dale yeah. to right the problem right now is if if we go we could do Sunday morning, but we would not have the chapel. We'd have to go back to our Sunday school room. I know Patty Patty wants to go back to our Sunday school room. Um maybe after Easter, how about that? I I and the problem is on Sunday, there was another Sunday school class here at 10 o'clock in the chapel. 
Um, and I don't think they're going to use the chapel, but I'm waiting for Pastor Dale to tell me that. And once we know that, then we can decide if we want to have Sunday, Sunday school here in the chapel or Sunday, Sunday school in our old Sunday school room. Um, I, I know how Patty would vote. I kind of like the chapel. I know you like the piano. Um, I'm thinking it might be easier um, because our old Sunday school class is on the second floor. We have an elevator. Um, yeah. We have an elevator, yeah. Yeah, we do have an elevator. <laughs> we have um, all our stuff up there. We have our bottles. And yeah, I know. Elevator. I know. We've got a lot of things up in our old Sunday school class. Um, anyway, we'll aim for Easter, and I will again, you know, ask Pastor Dale uh, about what's available. So no decision yet, Andy. The Lord will provide. The Lord will. The Lord will direct us. Bill, uh, devotion. The ambulance door was about to close with me on the inside. Outside, my son was on the phone to my wife. From my concussed fog, I called his name, and he recalls the moment. I slowly said, tell your mom I love her very much. Apparently, I thought this might be goodbye, and I wanted those to be my parting words in the moment. That's what mattered to me. As Jesus endured his darkest moment, he didn't merely tell us he loved us. He showed it in specific ways. He showed it to the mocking soldiers who had just nailed him to the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. He gave hope to the criminal crucified with him. Today you will be with me in paradise. Nearing the end, he looked at his mother. Here is your son, he said to her. And to his close friend, John, he said, here is your mother. Then as his life slipped from him, Jesus' act, last act of love was to trust his father. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus purposely chose the cross in order to show his obedience to his father and the depth of his love for us. To the very end, he showed us his relentless love. Let us pray. Father, thank you for loving us so much that you sent your beloved son to save us. Amen. Amen. Come right on up. Okay. Elaine. Thank you. It's all yours. <laughs> Well, good morning, everybody. Morning. And as you can tell, I decided it's the first day of spring. I'm wearing my spring coat. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I did. But I'm so glad we're all here together. Can everybody hear me? Can, you can hear me? Okay. This particular um, segment of lessons that we're doing is regarding prophets. And the month of March, we've done, we're doing faithful prophets. March 7th, we did the prophet of deliverance. March 14th, the prophet of conquest. March 28th, we'll do the prophet of courage. And today we're going to talk about the prophet of wisdom. Now, uh, to begin with, um, we want to talk about today the Huldah, the prophet's message, and, and our lesson recommends that during this week, each of us every day choose a leader, whether it's Mayor Curry, our president, who, a, a leader in our country, um, and pray for them by name. Uh, I, I, that they have wisdom to go forward. So if you would add 
a leader to your prayer list every day, I think, I think they'll feel it in their heart. So now, the information age in which we live is a double-edged sword. The massive amount of useful information is accompanied by massive amounts of factual errors and bias. Which customer review is the reliable guide to booking a hotel or a restaurant? Which news network should you count on as being the most trustworthy? What commentators or analysts do you turn to to get an unbiased sense of current events? In the lesson for this week, we encounter a young king who is faced with a similar question. His decision is still instructive after many centuries. The events recorded in this week's text took place in the days of Josiah, king of Judah, and he reigned from 640 to 609 BC. He was a godly king, known for his tireless attempts to purify Judah's worship and the temple. In the years preceding Josiah's rise to the throne, the kings of jo Judah had vacillated between devotion to the Lord and to idols. Josiah's great-grandfather, Hezekiah, <clears throat> who reigned from 724 to 695 had, uh, BC, had instituted a set of religious reforms in Judah that were intended to restore proper forms of worship. But gross unfaithfulness to the God of Israel characterized the reign of Hezekiah's son, Manasseh. He rebuilt pagan worship shrines his father had destroyed. Manasseh encouraged worship of the Baals as well as that of the sun, moon, and stars. Manasseh went so far as to offer his son in child sacrifice and built pagan altars within the Lord's temple itself. Late in his reign, Manasseh repented of his sin, but his former evil contributed directly to Judah's ultimate destruction and exile. Josiah's father, Amon, returned to the idolatry that characterized the earlier years of Manasseh. King Amon was assassinated in a palace coup after a two-year reign, and the people of the land made his eight-year-old son Josiah king in his place. Godly advisors among Judah's aristocracy apparently influenced Josiah. Some are named in today's text, other godly contemporaries included well-known prophets. Zephaniah, descendant of King Hezekiah, prophesied during the reign of Josiah. Jeremiah's prophetic ministry began in the 13th year of Josiah. No doubt their ministries were an impetus in Josiah's reforms leading up to these events. The result was that when Josiah was 16 years old, he began to seek the God of his father, David. In the 12th year of his reign, he began to purge the land of pagan idols, idols and shrines. About six years later, King Josiah ordered a renovation of the temple. The Book of Law was found within the temple in the process. Scholars disagree regarding the exact identity of the book that was found some believe it was a copy of the entire Law of Moses, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. Others believe it was only the book of Deuteronomy or some portion of it. Sometime in the previous decades, during the reigns of wicked Manasseh and Ammon, the book of the Law had been lost and forgotten. Or perhaps idolatrous priests intentionally misplaced it in order to hide the guilt of their own apostasy. When Shaphan reported to Josiah on the process of the repair project, Shaphan also alerted the king to the discovery of the book. Given Josiah's reaction of distress to what he heard read from that book, Deuteronomy may well have been the book's identity because it detailed the punishments Israel would suffer if the people failed to keep the covenant. 
These curses would culminate in exile from the land. Realizing the guilt of Judah, Josiah commissioned a delegation to inquire of the Lord concerning the wrath that the king feared would soon be visited on him and his kingdom. And a description of the nature of that delegation is how today's lesson opens. So our, um, our, devotion, our reading for today is from 2 Kings, chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. Hilkiah, the priest, Ahikam, Akbor, Shaphan, and Isaiah went to speak to the prophet Huldah, who was the wife of Shalom, son of Tikva, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. She lived in Jerusalem in the new quarter. She said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Tell the man who sent you to me, This is what the Lord says. I am going to bring disaster on this place and its people according to everything written in the book the king of Judah has read. Because they have <coughs> forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and aroused my anger by all their, the idols their hands have made, my anger will burn against this place and will not be quenched. Tell the king of Judah who sent you, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the word you heard. Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken against this place and its people, that they would become a curse and be laid waste. And because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, I will gather you to your ancestors, and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I am going to bring on this place. So they took her answer back to the king. So let's look at these verses a little more closely, and starting with the first part of 14. Hilkiah the priest, Aikam, Akbor, Shaphan, and Isaiah, here we see the forming of a delegation. This is the first action taken as a result of King jo Josiah's order in 2 Kings. Seven men bear the name Hilkiah in the Old Testament. The one here was not only a priest, but was also, but was the high priest. Ahikam was the son of the secretary, Shaphan. Members of this family seem to have been devout followers of the Lord, as borne out later. Akbor, another official in Josiah's court, was the father of Elnathan, who became an official in the court of King Jehoiakim. Josiah's son, um, Isaiah, was earlier designated as the king's attendant. Now the next part of verse 14 continues, went to speak to the prophet Huldah, who was the wife of Shalom, son of Tikva, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. She lived in Jerusalem in the new quarter. The prophet Huldah appears elsewhere only in the parallel account of this event in 2 Chronicles. Nothing more is known about her except what is given in these two accounts. Jewish tradition holds that she and Jehoiada, the priest, were both buried in Jerusalem, an honor reserved for those of King David's family. And this bolsters the impression that the delegation felt no hesitation in consulting Huldah. Although female prophets in Israel were rarer than male ones, Huldah's role is not without precedent in the Old Testament. Miriam, Deborah, and the unnamed wife of Isaiah precede her in being designated prophet. Huldah's husband, Shalom, may have been Jeremiah's uncle. The dwelling of this husband and wife in the new quarter is uncertain in location, but likely indicates a particular area of Jerusalem and we can contrast to the 2011 
NIV's new quarter with the 1984 NIV's 2nd District. Verses 15 and 16. Verse 15, a judgment is coming. She said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Tell the man, the man who sent you to me. Now, Huldah begins her response with the prophetic formula, This is what the Lord says. Her use of this phrase, which occurs more than 500 times in the Old Testament, marks her as a true prophet. Adding the God of Israel emphasized the Lord's sovereignty over the nation and his relationship to it. God chose to associate himself with Israel specifically. Though this fact should have had, should have had the implication for how the people behave, this did not often play out in reality. Huldah's referring, referring to King Josiah as the man who sent you, created space between the king and herself. Though he was powerful, she was the one who had heard the true word from God to share. Her words reminded the delegation that Josiah was merely a man who, like all people, was subject to God's reign. Verse 16 says, This is what the Lord says. I am going to bring disaster on this place and its people according to everything written in the book the king of Judah has read. By using the prophetic formula, this is what the Lord says a second time, Huldah reemphasized that her words came from the Lord. What she is about to say is also her own conviction, but it does not originate with her. The first part of Huldah's oracle concerned Judah in general plus Jerusalem and or its temple in particular. In the context at hand, it is most likely, it most likely, it likely indicates Jerusalem in general since the destruction of the temple without concurrent destruction of the city wouldn't make sense. As great as King Josiah's desire was to spare his nation, he could not save Judah from coming judgment. Thus, Huldah indicated that Josiah's worst fears were justified. Moses has borne that destruction would come if the Israelites were disobedient to the Lord. Later prophets based their judgment oracles on warnings found in the law of Moses. Josiah may have heard these calamities read straight out of Deuteronomy. <clears throat> Even if he heard some other texts, the curses would be very similar to those of Deuteronomy chapter 28. Older versions of the Bible translate the Lord's intent to bring disaster as bringing evil. But the underlying Hebrew does not refer to moral evil. Instead, it should be understood as physical harm or affliction. This announcement of coming judgment through calamity echoes earlier announcements against the dynasties of the wicked kings, Jeroboam. It also parallels the indictment in 2 Kings that was delivered by prophets in the day of Josiah's grandfather, Manasseh. Verse 17 says, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and aroused my anger by all the idols their hands have made, my anger will burn against this place and will not be quenched. Josiah's having forsaken, Judah's having forsaken God for idols would result in punishment. What Moses had warned about, Huldah recognized as forthcoming reality in Judah. Jeremiah also cited Judah's having burned incense to other gods as evidence of their idolatry. That was the means by which the nation provoked the Lord's anger. Both the idols and the sacrifices offered to the idols were works their hands have made. Tragically, God's anger was abundantly justified since it had been provoked by intentional human rebellion. This had happened so often that the limits of the Lord's patience 
were exceeded. Zephaniah indicated that Judah was rotten to the core. The fire of God's judgment would burn and it would not be quenched. Now, following, continuing on to verse 18, the first part, tell the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord. Huldah's message of judgment against Judah was not the final word. Whereas she had previously identified Josiah simply as the man who sent you to me, she here identified him specifically as the king of Judah. This description highlighted Josiah's leadership role. And the Hebrew behind the phrase, inquire of the Lord, occurs only six times in the Old Testament, always in the context of great seriousness. The 18 continues, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the words you heard. The prophetess once again used the prophetic formula, this is what the Lord says, to reinforce that her words came from God. This repetition emphasized the Lord's special relationship with all of Israel. And then verse 19 says, because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken against this place and its people, that they would become a curse and be laid waste. And because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. When Shaphan read the law to Josiah, the king was shaken to his core. He had torn his ropes to signify his grief. That was an appropriate response to the words of the scroll that announced that Jerusalem would become a curse and laid waste. God had heard Josiah and had seen his weeping and the state of his heart. So God had decided to honor the king's humble and contrite response. Moses had described such repentance as a prerequisite for the Lord's restoring Israel after it fell under his judgment. Such humble repentance had led God to delay the demise of Ahab's dynasty, to postpone judgment in the days of Hezekiah, and to restore Josiah's grandfather Manasseh. The New Testament highlights the centrality of humility and repentance before God. The prophetic formula declares the Lord underscores that God has honored the king's contrition. Its repetition throughout Huldah's prophecy does more than just legitimize her as a spokesperson for God. It also gave the king's delegation confidence to repeat to the king what they had learned, knowing that the prophecy was reliable. Now, many kings of Israel and Judah paid little heed to God's word because they were so impressed with themselves. By contrast, Josiah was a model of humble leadership. He placed God and the welfare of his nation before himself, and God blessed him as a result. During this week, think about what steps you can take to humble yourself and I can humble myself for the good of God's people. Verse 20, the first part says, Therefore, I will gather you to your ancestors. You will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I'm going to bring to this place. The Lord would honor the king by protecting him from the punishment coming against Judah. The phrase, I will gather you to your ancestors, is a variation on the formula rested with his ancestors, as used throughout 1 and 2 Kings. The king would not experience the disaster that God would bring on the temple, Jerusalem, and Judah. The phrase, you will be buried in peace, may seem to contradict what we know about Josiah's death in battle. But the idea is that Josiah would die at peace with God, 
He would not personally witness what the words of the book anticipated and what Hulda confirmed. The devastating de destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple at the hands of the Babylonians in 586 BC. The message of God through Huldah confirmed anew his righteousness, faithfulness, and mercy. God would be faithful to the word he had uttered centuries before when he warned Israel of the penalties that would result from unfaithfulness to the covenant. Verse 20 continues, so they took her answer back to the king. Now the message of the prophetess and the words of the book resulted in Josiah's convening the nation for a covenant renewal ceremony. He also enacted further measures to cleanse the temple and the land from elements of idolatry. Judah was spared while Josiah was alive, but after his death, Judah returned to evil ways and experienced the promised curses, the destruction of Jerusalem, and the temple at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, as well as the exile in Babylon. Now, to conclude, the events recorded in 2 Kings highlight both the importance of engaging with God's words and responding to them. It seems absurd that the Book of Law was neglected and lost to the people of Judah. Yet is that any more ridiculous than the Bible's loss to myriads of Christians who rarely read it? We must guard against losing scripture in our churches, our homes, and our lives. We honor God when we do his will as recorded in scripture. Josiah sought to do just that through his reforms after the book of law was found. He acted on the words he had heard from that book, and he showed remorse over the sin of his people, and he sought godly insight into what he had read to him. Scripture study must always lead us to repentance and action based on what we encounter in its pages. This is the faithful response to learning God's will. The process involves consulting competent interpreters of scripture, of scripture and studying it alongside other believers who are willing to hold us accountable to its words. May we, like Josiah, surround ourselves with faithful companions as we seek God's guidance. And I want to tell you the, um, the verse for today that we're supposed to um, feel in our heart is the key verse. Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken against this place and its people, that they would become a curse and laid waste. And because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. That's 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 19. So, and our thought to remember today, God hears those who humbly seek him. And let us close with a prayer. Father, we praise you as the God of mercy and grace, whose love for us has been demonstrated in mercy to Josiah and ultimately through your son, Jesus Christ. We ask that you forgive us when we fail to heed your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. I'm not fast, but I'll get there. Fine. <laughs> we're, we're all a little slow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it gets a little slower. In, you don't in have to time. be sonic. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this past week was St. Patrick's Day, so I consider that the whole week almost. Oh. The rain was pouring down outside O'Connor's Irish pub in Nanaimino, 
Standing in front of a big puddle outside the pub was my old Irishman uncle, drenched, holding a stick with a piece of string dangling in the water. A passerby stopped and asked him, what are you doing? Fishing, replied my uncle. Feeling sorry for the old man, the gent says, come in out of the rain and have a drink with me. In the warm ambience of the pub, as they sip their whiskeys, the gentleman, being a bit of superior smart ass, cannot resist asking, so how many have you caught today? You're the eighth. <laughs> <laughs> if you'll all stand. <laughs> Let the, the words, words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen.